We all know education is one of the biggest things in the industry at the moment. It's why we've created the XY Advisor platform. It allows advisors to do short four-week courses. And what we're really keen to do is to get as many awesome content providers in there. So if you're an advisor or a service provider who have put together an awesome solution which can affect change in the way an advisor does their job on a Monday morning, please do put together an application for us at www.xyadvisor.com. Vince Scully. Welcome. Adrian Patty, how are you? <laughs> Good, man. It's great to have you on here. It's um, it's not your first time, is it? No, it's not. So you're there are bit... not too many first-time experiences left when you get to my age. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Can someone get the violin out? <laughs> We've, but you weren't on the actual um, in the studio. No, I was sitting in my office with my... Um, Earbu- earbuds in with that my, mini mini sound delay that just means that you can sometimes miss. It's miss. so much better now. That's it's right. So much better. So it's uh, th- hey, cheers, man. W- welcome to the cheers, studio. Woo. So Life Sherpas, uh, the um, I guess the a cool. All right, I'm still going to give it startup status. <laughs> like all right, like from a not from a from a stage of business, but just from an innovation standpoint. It's a bit of a disruptor, you might say. Would you? Well, how long has it been around for now? Well, as a concept, it's been around for nearly ooh, four or five years. But we've been live for two years, hmm. almost two years. Well, startups fair them. Yeah, I think that's fair. Oh, I, I, I like the side of startups where people think like, well, they're doing something new, and this is like certainly what you've been doing the last few years. And well, uh, I guess for some people that don't know about um, what the journey's been like, do you, would you like to share? Sure. Well, the concept behind Life Sherpa was financial advice for people without any money. And that may sound a bit silly, but what I mean by that is that it's the uh, the unadvised portion of the population. We've all heard those numbers about 20% of the population is, only, is there only people who've seen a financial planner. Well, there's actually a really good reason for that. And that is when you look at Australia's 8.6 million households, only 20% of them have more than $100,000 of non-super investable assets. Mm-hmm. Uh. So if you're running a business that's fundamentally around assets under management, mm-hmm. well, actually, that's a full market. Now, that's not to say it's a bad business, because if you take 19,000 financial planners, 1.9 million households, that's 100 each, mm. which is a pretty good business. And and the I guess the... Um, the numbers are about to get rejigged over the next few years, so it's probably going to be about 150 per planner on those stats. Exactly. What, do you mean, what do you mean? Oh, there's going to be an attrition in AR statuses. What are you trying to say, Paddy? What, what are you trying? What are you trying to say? Um, well, there's a there's a number of variables coming into play. Are you bearish on advisor numbers? I am very bearish on advisor <laughs> numbers. How come? Um, well, uh, education standards. Um, business model disruption, removal of ga- grandfathering potential. Um, there's a lot of things that would edge a lot of people out of the industry because it's a complete change required for some businesses to what's been done over the last few years. So, yeah, I'm not sure I fully agree with that. You know, um, reckon- I'm sure there is lots of change coming, mm. but is it any more than the change we've had over the last 25 years? Yeah, this is an industry that's gone from financial advice 1.0, which was selling insurance mm-hmm. and selling managed funds to 2.0, which was strategy mm-hmm. used to sell products. And now... <laughs> <laughs> and now... <laughs> tell, me, tell me about 3.0. <laughs> Finance, financial advice 3.0 is about focusing on actually giving advice, which requires products for implementation. And I think that's the fundamental change that we're seeing. Now, mm. lots of people who started this game 30 years ago may not have kept up with that and could get away with it for the last... 20 years, but I think that's where the change is happening. And you, most of those people are going to be, you know, 55, 60 plus, mm. and many still have bowlers. Mm. So, well, um, so what does that, what, what do you think is so going to So I think there will be, there will be some attrition, but it will be at that very upper end. Mm. And most of them have clients who are older than themselves. Mm. So there's sort of 20 years of life left for those so advisors. So booming year for aged care specialists. Yeah. Hmm. I was going to – so that third level, I'd argue there's almost like a, a fourth level above that. 3.0.1. <laughs> oh, I'd even give it a 4.0, actually. Yeah, what's that? Well, so you sort of – you delved into the strategy space and the technical space and just – but 
Like, really? Like, when you go further above that, it's actually what's a higher value proposition? It's the relationship, the, the behavioural side of things and what's happening there. Like, you've done a lot in that space. Absolutely. I and mean, this whole behavioural thing is is the key to it. So, And I think Vanguard even did some numbers on this. I uh, can't remember the fancy word they use for it. What comes after alpha, beta, gamma, delta? Delta, epsilon, delta, gamma. Anyway, they, 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 they coin I don't know. Echo. I learned, I learned <laughs> epsilon. <laughs> or... I was just, I, I learned the Greek alphabet when I was in primary school. So ah. um, that's how it it's, the, it's the one link you have to your heritage. Yeah. My grandma's <laughs> still not very impressed with my. Uh, so it's actually Patagopoulos or something, is it? No, it actually <laughs> used to be Varapatis. Varapatis. Yeah. And like 1940s um, Greek family growing up in Tamworth, they uh, thought they'd anglicised it a little bit. So they. <laughs> Fair enough. They turned me <laughs> Irish. Um, <laughs> It's actually O Patty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or Muck Patty. Yeah. Well, my, my alcohol consumption would match that. Uh, <laughs> Holla. <laughs> so you ran the Euro shop in Tamworth, did you? I did. My, uh, my dad used to, they had a cafe there actually, and my, um, my father used to, I think they, they didn't have it till he was too much older, but um, yeah, when he was little, he used to sort of be at the cash register. You know, think about those like little corner stores in the suburbs where the kids still come up and they like they take the cash. That was mm-hmm. what he used cash to Cash money, special? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There was no pay pass going on back then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but getting back to behaviour, you know, I think Vanguard did some numbers where they suggested that of the 3% a year that a financial advisor could add for their client, two point something of it came from behaviour. Mm. They're, not, uh, they're not precise numbers, but go Google the Vanguard report. It's, mm. it's good reading. Um, and that's really where I come from. I think the vast bulk of this is is behaviour. You know, personal finance is called personal finance for a reason because mm. it's personal. And I see lots of people who manage big budgets at work, mm-hmm. you know, million dollar budgets at work, and have no problems with it, but their own finances are a mess. Mm. And why is that? It's because emotions get in the way. Totally. And what we got to do is develop techniques to manage those emotions and uh, that's where a good advisor comes in. Mm. And what do you suggest? Well, I mean, there's <clears throat> lots of ways you can do it. Um, at Life Sherpa, we focus on, uh, I guess, three things that we start with. The first one is personality, and we've got a personality profile. What, of that. the clients have to have one? Or? Uh, <laughs> yes, which is, why we, which, which is why we don't have accountants and actuaries. As oh, 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 Peter will have something to say to you about that. <laughs> well, as an accountant, I think I can say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> touché, touché. <laughs> So you figure out their personality. Yeah. So there's, you know, as advisors, we've always looked at risk, you know, risk tolerance and risk, risk tolerance and ability to wear risk. But there's 12 other psychological traits that actually make up how we deal with money. Uh, they're things like involvement. Mm-hmm. So we've all had those engineers and teachers as clients who want to second guess everything we do. Well, they will generally profile with a high involvement score. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have people who've got... Um, high work ethic, you know, they believe that success comes from work, it's not about luck, mm-hmm. and others who believe it's about luck. Um, there are others who have got a lot of altruism and trust, you know, they trust that other people will generally look after their money, they think that they should look after other people. Mm-hmm. So all those traits go together to make up your, explain why you do what you do with when it comes to money. And that, so that's where we start. Um, interesting. What, what's the name of that test? Or we call it the Life Sherpa Money Personality Profiler. Oh, there you go. Okay, um, very cool. So we actually license some of the underlying technology out of the US, but right. we host the, the quiz and process the answers. Awesome. But the, but the underlying algorithm comes from, from the US, and it's been around for about 30 years. Right. And there are hundreds of thousands of US profiles that we can benchmark against. We've, what, we've got about 4,000 now that we we benchmark. Wow. And it's, it's remarkably reliable. Um, we uh, one of the profiles is the, is the hunter, mm-hmm. which it tends to be female, um, and they generally have a um, they spend for prestige. So the classic mm-hmm. is I'm a successful lawyer. I need to look the part, and so they spend lots of money on clothes. That's sort of right. the classic one. Uh, guys would do the same thing with a car. Yeah. Yep. I'm a successful real estate agent. I've got to drive a BMW. Um, so those behaviours generally lead to a spending problem. And that's our number one profile that we get at Life Sherpa. And they tend to be young women in creative or professional jobs. Gotcha. And making Me- what per year? Oh, uh, 100 plus. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So they're, so they're not 
poor, they've got lots of income, yeah, but they've got big spending. Yes. And spending that's about this external validation. Mm. And when you actually combine that then with values, when you go from personality to values to goals, you actually can change that behaviour. So it's not really so personality is not in your DNA. It's not mm. fixed for life. You can so change level? over time. So it's, it's what's showing up at the time. Yeah. Well, what would you suggest to someone to a, to a young female who's making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and she spends all of her money? What What would you suggest? Well, the first step is actually understanding that and sure. why you're doing that. Um, so I don't see it as my role to say, well, look, you shouldn't buy a Kate Spade handbag. Right. Um, if you want a Kate Spade handbag, buy a Kate They've Spade. It's probably handbag. gone up in price recently. Probably. It might be collector's items now. Yeah. Um, but that's not our role as advisors. Our role is to say, well, he, he, let's help you understand why you're doing that and understand whether that's adding value to your life. Right. So you take personality, then you take values, and their values are X, Y, Z, and, and, and then you can show them or, or, or and say, this is where you're spending your money and this is what your values are, and then there's a disconnect. That's right. And that disconnect is what leads to these feelings of angst. Right. So, you know, the two most common expressions we hear people, particularly in that sort of late 20s, early 30s, the two big sayings you get is, I just feel like I'm not getting ahead, or why are my friends buying houses and I can't? Mm. And the answer is actually around aligning spending and values, because buying a house might not actually be aligned with your values and personality. You might p- prefer to spend the money on travel or whatever. And it's not our role as advisors. I, just, I don't see it as our role to say, you know, spending on holidays bad, spending on house good. It's lining the two up. And um, that's where the personality... So personality values. So what, what's really important to you? Yeah, so you see lots of people valuing adventure, excitement, where travel's really important. So we've got to help them build a spending plan that takes that into account, but leaves enough for the, I feel like I'm getting ahead stuff. Mm. So, and then you, that brings you on to goals. And once you've got those three together, you can... Uh, Personality, values, and goals. goals. And goals in that context is not financial goals. Nobody ever... Yeah, I've been in this game for a long time. Nobody's ever walked into my office and said, I've got a real goal to save 20% of my income. <laughs> right? We fabricated that as part of our strategy or planning where we sometimes create these financial goals. These goals are all a function of a life goal. Mm-hmm. So you've got someone who's got a life goal to open a yoga studio. Well, that's going to create a whole bunch of goals. It's going to create some... Education goals, you might need to get a certificate. It's going to create some lifestyle goals, like you need to be fit and flexible. And it's going to create a financial goal because you now need you need some money for rent, you need some money for marketing, you need to keep yourself going while you're, while you're doing it. So you put all of that together and now you've got a plan that aligns with their values. That sounds remarkable. It, it, I mean, it, it's amazing it's taken me 35 years to get here. It sounds really good. <laughs> it's... And you're an you're an ex accountant. I'm an ex accountant. And and now you're off with the fairies. No, I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> but it sounds amazing, mate. So where did you get all this from, or did you just think it up? It's come out. I mean, there's a huge amount of research gone into it, but it really came out of my previous experience. Um, so my last advice business, which I sold to Mark Boris in 2007. Um, Hello. Good timing. Great um, timing. <laughs> December 2007. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 my goodness. That uh, we had you know, 111 clients. All of them had self-managed super fund. All of them had more than a million dollars and all were over 65. And what was I doing for them? Well, do they really care that we made another 35 basis points a year on their investments? No, not really. Mm. And some of them particularly valued particular activities. Like we had one woman, she was a retired uh, professor. She was in her 70s, had a 40-year-old boyfriend. And there were two things that she was obsessed about. One, that the boyfriend wasn't <laughs> going to get the money. Okay. That's what that right. is <laughs> so funny. Okay. And two, and this was the one that really did my head in, she wanted a health card. Just, yeah, just for, yeah. She, just she was per- because all she of her friends. perfectly healthy. She'd never I been paid all my taxes all these years. <laughs> yeah, I want a bloody health card. And 
We got her a health card. Hi. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it works anymore. But back then, you could you could do it, wow. and that was what she loved us for. So she was paying us you know, forty thousand dollars a year in fees. Yes. And the thing she valued most about this was not our investment expertise or our dealing with her RBLs. Don't have RBLs anymore, but no. um, you know, sorting all her compliance and all that sort of stuff. Yep. And all she was obsessed about was this medical card. Yeah. And, and so that's and stopping the funds going to the toy bank. Yeah. And that sort of says, <laughs> guys, this is not about money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I- called financial planning, but it's not actually about the money. It's about what we do with it. Do advisors use the Life Sherpa as an onboarding program? Our advisors do. Would is, oh, could is, could other advisors? Can other advisors? Um, there's no reason why that um, personality profiler couldn't be made available to other advisors. We haven't today, um, but it could be. Okay, and it could be white labelled for Great. the right sort of volumes. Um, it's um, got to help people on. Or maybe that's something what like XY could consider doing as a it's service to its members. Um, but anyway, so setting that aside. Um, yeah, so that was my epiphany was, well, actually, what am I doing here as an advisor? These are people who've got lots of money, relatively speaking, and am I making a difference to their life? Well, not really. Oh, sure, her medical card was a great story, <laughs> but, and she was glad, but, you know, six weeks later, that was all water under the bridge, and um, yet we had this bulk of the population who really needed some help and wasn't able to get it because we as an industry needed to charge an assets under management fee. And 80% of the households in the country have less than $100,000 of non-super assets. So what's the story here? And that was really... And the thing that... Does, so that set off a journey. That where... set off a journey. And the journey there really is what do they want and or what do they need? And they need help with um, what, what we now call... Um, living the life you want with the money you have. Mm-hmm. And that last bit is the important point. I got, I got a much uh, more succinct way of saying that. It's uh, just fund your ideal lifestyle. <laughs> exactly. Um, available to all good bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> but not available in the Amazon overseas store. I mean. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, um, we uh, as advisors, we, what do we do? We rebranded ourselves as wealth managers and alienated... 50% of the population who don't think they have wealth. Hmm. And that was one of the big things that came out in our focus studies was this group of people said, wealth, what's that? We don't have it. We have money. Hmm. We have money problems. We have goals and aspirations, but we don't actually have wealth. Yeah. Now, many of them do have wealth, but not the way... Wealth is such a well, the perception weird, of... weird, weird word. It's a horrible word. I hate it. It's very, yeah. It's very subjective. But it's just so, like... No one thinks they're wealthy. You ask, you you think of someone you think's wealthy, and then ask them if they think they're wealthy, and they'll be Vince. like, "Vince, no." no. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, perfect example, uh, right? But but no, but if you seriously the goal talk to someone, keep on moving. Uh, correct. No one thinks they're wealthy. So yeah, it's Are such we a there yet? it's such a yeah, it's such a bad word, isn't it? It is. And as an industry, right through the nineties and noughties. Are we, we actually all... calling them naughties? Are we, comf- I don't know. are we comfortable with doing that now? They're over now. <laughs> <laughs> you can call them whatever you want. <laughs> um, and for a lot of people, they weren't a particularly good decade, but setting that aside, um, <laughs> we as an industry rebranded from financial planning or financial advice to wealth management. Mm. And what does it mean? Or are you saying know. it flipped from there to wealth management? Yeah. Well, no yeah. one talked about wealth management in the 90s. Oh. This is a new rebranding of the industry. A phenomena. A so, phenomena. So, 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 well, so it's me. interesting. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, interesting when you go out to the accounting world. So we, we talk to a lot of accountants around financial advice. And when you say financial advice in that world, if you don't go, like, if you don't bring in, like, wealth, they don't, they don't get it. They don't, like, because they're the financial advisors mm. for their clients, which are businesses generally. But they don't, a lot of them don't really get this personal financial planner concept. It's like... Yeah, you you like invest the money, and this is like a majority of the accounting world. Like it's it's 
it's really it's like when you think about how big that is like these guys are the ones that are actually a lot of the potential clients out there are linked to these guys and they actually don't know what financial planning is so how are you going to get a referral from someone that doesn't get financial planning from a concept standpoint exactly so it's a, yeah it's just interesting and, and you, that you, that, you, that, just got, you just got to follow the money if you look at the total fees and commissions paid by Australian consumers it's about six billion dollars a year and less than 20 percent of that is paid for non-super investment advice Non-super. Less than 20%. 40% of it is paid on debt. Yes. And about 30% on risk. Okay. And the rest is investment advice. So all of this stuff that we've been focused on for the last 20 years about investment management, something we can't add a lot of value to once you get beyond asset allocation. Totally. And it's a tiny part of the... Revenue but, pie. But back in like before Life Sherpa days, like you were picking the best investments, weren't you, Vince? Well, you we, were... we we did actually run. <laughs> we ran MDAs before they were trendy. So we but were they like? Was there a value? Like, so like, there's two ways to run MDAs. There's those MDAs where like the um, there's some sort of investment uh, philosophy, and then it actually exceeds that and does really well. And then there's the MDAs where like, oh, it's, it's so confusing that there's no benchmark to assess to. <laughs> Here, here's another look at your confusing portfolio every year. And um, yeah. No, we actually spent, <laughs> spent a lot of time on, which, on which attribution you... analysis. Okay. We, we ran it in-house. <laughs> we actually had an MDA license okay. um, in 2003. And um, we had an in internal funds manager mm -hmm. who had a broker's assistant and an admin assistant to run the book. And then we had planners who didn't do that. So it was like an internal funds management business. But we did attribution analysis. So we started with a strategic asset allocation, and then every month we tilted it. Mm -hmm. So we looked at, well, what did that tilt actually do, plus mm -hmm. or minus? Yeah. And then you look at what did your stock selection do, plus or minus? Okay. Even down to execution of the trade. So my broker's, oh, how it was so my broker's assistant was appraised on how much above or below VWAP for the day that he achieved. Wow. What? So That's we, some stats collection there. Well, <laughs> that, 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 it goes with the territory. But that was how we looked at it. And we said, well, look, if we're going to do this, we've got to demonstrate that we're adding value. Yep. Um, now, the client wasn't necessarily seeing that as a fee for advice because they paid a single fee, mm. which was tiered. So it wasn't a percentage of AUM, but it was tiered. So obviously, the more you had, the more you paid. Mm -hmm. And that included you know, the MDA, your self managed super fund admin, tax return, bought it, yep. a complete one-stop shop. And um, it was a very profitable business. So yeah, it's a good, it was a good business. Um, but did you achieve alpha? We did. Um, did you sell your company based on achieving alpha? It, we sold it based on run rate EBIT. Um, so <laughs> no, no, sorry. Did, <laughs> very nice. But um, no, So did I sell it to the clients? Yeah. Um, that wasn't a particular... Um, well, alpha in the pure investment sense, probably not. But if you look back in those days, you know, there was a huge amount of value you could add by looking at RBLs. That's reasonable benefit limits mm. for anyone who's what, listening. <laughs> yeah, those, those are like um, super rules from back in the day yeah. where they used to change it every year. Well, that was before they changed them every year. Yeah, oh, That geez. was where they were that way for years until Peter Costello changed it all and changed the world in 2007. Um, just in time for everyone to tip in a million dollars and lose it in the GFC. Ooh. <laughs> or, or buy a, an advice business, if you might work. Or indeed buy an advice business. <laughs> um, and so you, there was a huge amount of value you could add from a technical structuring perspective. So that was value that you could clearly demonstrate. Mm. Uh, and we had quite a few clients who had very large super balances and equally big RBLs. Are you saying that... Um that you see the system simplified since yeah, then? Yeah, I reckon super, super in particular is much simpler than it used to be. So there's less, um, I guess, opportunities to really offer something, offer offer value in that space from a strategic standpoint That's bes besides just put more in sort of thing yeah. and creating that behaviour change. Yeah, there is. Okay. Um, that may sound strange to anyone who's lived through the last decade. Or even like, yeah, most people entering, they're like, oh, they just changed the rules again last year. Like those 1.6 mil, that's a bit, that's created a bit of complexity. Or are you saying that's nothing compared to those RBL days? No. But bear in mind that a 1.6 million balance limit looks awfully like an RBL. Yes. Is that, <laughs> that was essentially the same philosophy, wasn't yeah. it? So it's, the... it's really saying in those days you could put as much as you wanted in 
um, but you could only get tax concessions on your reasonable balance limit. Mm. Yeah, reasonable benefit limit, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Which is sort of... So they, they <laughs> so they just left it long enough for a whole lot of people to dump shitloads of money on who had no problems supporting themselves in retirement for about... That's over 10 years, isn't it? Yeah. They've just been able to add... What's the max each year? Oh, yeah, let's just put that in the super. It's a good thing because the welfare system would have been overloaded if they weren't able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure how that works. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that, that was a, you know, we went through the from the sort of no rules of the 80s to the RBL world in the 90s. How was that? Actually, can you tell us about this no rule world? It sounds like it'd be fun and well, maybe we, like... Um, yeah, before the CIS Act in 91. It was 91 the CIS Act, wasn't it? Um, oh, I, I was only born a couple of years yeah, before The that. self-managed super <laughs> fund world was the Wild West um, and you you saw a lot of people with very big balances. Okay. Because um, that, that was when you could just put... More or less, yeah. Whatever you wanted into a pretty tax concessional and you could, environment. And there was very limited rules. Um, and then we sort of had that tightening up in the CIS Act and then... Costello sort of unwound it all in 2007. Mm. So maybe we've just got back to a more complicated way of getting to the same thing. And maybe... <laughs> Don't <one> say <laughs> that all that pain was just for the same outcome. Is that what you're saying? It's- yeah, I'm not sure there's a lot of difference between our 1.6 million... What's the what's what's it called? Super ba- balance cap. The balance cap, yeah. yeah. Um, is um, all that different to an RBL? Mm-hmm. Albeit it's a flat number, so it's easy to know. So you can just remember 1.6 million. That's true. Back then, every every person had their own individual RBL. Yeah, so that that kept you working. Which that kept, gave kept you a bit of working, and there was a whole bunch of technical stuff around that that you needed to keep right on top of, which and, is why accountants were particularly good at it. Well, on the accounting side of things, for the personal like individual situations, there was a lot more things you could do back yeah. then. Like really, the restriction on the personal tax um, minimisation space mm. is really, like, there's not as much as what could be done back then. That's right. Less forestry, forestry schemes. Uh, well, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I must admit, I, I always maintain that I'd much rather give the money to the tax office than give it to these guys to plant in trees when I'd never see it again. Um, that's true. So because you, you lots of people things. lost lots of money in those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us more about um, the life Sherpa right. of Wall Street in the 90s. <laughs> Is that different to the wolf? <laughs> yeah, up to that end of the nineties. Yeah, um, so, you, so yeah. You're, you're tossing, you're tossing small people in in the office. Is is that what you were up to? No, it was not. It was no quite that. <laughs> Although I must. That's admit, one of my favourite parts of that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I must admit, when I did start, when I started in London in 1983, when before they deregulated the market over the year, so commissions were regulated, so stockbroking commissions. There was a number, I can't remember what it was, but it was the law. So you couldn't compete on price. Oh, so it was a fl- like a set fee. So there not was a, a cap. So the like... government said, here's the price that you're going to charge as a stockbroker. So everyone charged that and went off to lunch. And a normal lunch involved at least two pints of beer every day. Boom. And the long lunch was alive and well. And then the American banks came along. Is that, that's like every day? Yeah. That was the... That sounds like that a... Was a good, that that's was, living. That, that was it. <laughs> um, I mean, the rest of the world wasn't particularly healthy at that time, which I'll get back to in a moment. But then the American banks came in and they didn't drink at lunchtime. Ah, oh, so fun. And and they moved from the city to Victoria. So JP, uh, was it JP Morgan's? I think it was Morgan's was at Victoria, which is the other end of the city for anyone who's been in London. And they just changed the lunchtime culture. And then they deregulated in 86. So commissions were deregulated. And the city just went wild. And that was the booming 80s, the sort of 80, 85 to... Well, because it just became so much more competitive. Yeah. And, and the cost of... And everyone was pumping in. money in. The Thatcher government was privatising stuff. So everyone was a share owner. Mm. And um, they were developing a whole bunch of new units, apartments in London. The depression of the early 80s was sort of over and it was boom times. And um, then, of course, 87 came along. And the property crash in 90, mm-hmm. which obviously happened here as well. What were you doing at the 87 crash? In the 87 crash, I was actually working for Mobile Oil and I was travelling the world, but I was heavily exposed to... Um, so you weren't dealing in the markets no, yourself? No. You, you were just exposed at to... At that point, I was, I was an investor. So I was making... I'd finished... I graduated business school in 86 
and um, started to work for Mobile Oil and travelling through Middle East Asia and buying a lot of shares and you know, heavily overexposed. So in 19, October 1987, I was, I was in Vienna and I could see the headlines in German, but I couldn't sort of read them. Oh, and this is pre-internet, so it wasn't like your phone told you. That was you. the only way you were going to find out. And so I'm <laughs> walk, walking down the street to the offers and seeing all these big headlines going, mm, that doesn't look very good, but I've got no idea what it means. <laughs> all these arrows pointing down. Like, and <laughs> so I got into the office and um, phoned my broker in London and goes, what's happening? And... Um, it was, pretty hard, it was pretty hard to get through. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, much, how much, what are the losses like in uh, percentage terms? Uh, I think on the first day it would have fallen like 20, 30%. So it's, wow. I don't think it was as bad as the, the GFC. The day of the GFC. Mm. Um, but, uh, and it recovered, I think, more quickly. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. But the only thing that saved me was the fact that Japan took two years to fall. So it taught me the benefits of diversification. Mm. So if if I hadn't been heavily exposed to Japan, right, I would have been stuffed completely. Right. Was okay. there leverage? There was lots of leverage. Uh-huh. <laughs> there we go. Um, sorry, I just kicked the table there. Um, That's all right. So lots of leverage. Um, and CFDs weren't around back then, but no. um, futures contracts were out? Yeah, well, it was expensive to buy. Um, so it was more of a margin loan, essentially. So more margin, margin lending. Oh, so you're really backing it. We got um, a baller here. <laughs> so <laughs> it taught me the benefits of diversification, um, and in some ways, not having that internet presence helped you help me manage through it. Because mm, you you're not getting updates every five minutes saying the market's down another twenty points or thirty points or two hundred points. Um, you just got to go. Well, look, it's down. Now what do I do? And LCD TV screens weren't everywhere around. Correct. So you weren't guests going, you know your portfolio's going down. Do you know your portfolio's going down? You're just trying to walk away. MTV had just started. Yeah. I don't think Fox, well, Fox News didn't exist. I don't think Sky existed. Mm. Um, so This is a bit of a history lesson for some of the XYs <laughs> out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to sound like the old codger in the group, but um, ah, it was an interesting young time. And it was an interesting it's- time. And having felt that, personal experience, um, it, I think, allows me to help people through it in future. When you know what the risk is and and, and if, you look, felt if you look at Australia, well, we, we had... So I arrived in Australia in 90, so just to experience the the near collapse of Westpac, the, the collapse of Pyramid Building Society, Tricontinental. So all of the... Um, yeah, so not, the early '90s was not a a particularly happy place, particularly in Victoria. There was a lot of shifts going on in the economy. Yeah, and um, that's the last time we had a real um, was the last down? depression recession. Yeah. Always, always nervous about using words like recession and depression. You know, they say the difference is a recession is when you lose your jobs. Sorry, a, a recession is when your your mate loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the economic definition of... Well, I, guess, I guess the main point is there hasn't been enough hit to the economic psyche of Australia since then to really, uh, I guess, slow, I guess, uh, over-exuberance down, you might say. That's right. So you go from 91, even 99, 2000, which affected the US, didn't really affect us here. You know, the tech crash... No, when you look at the difference, really the Aussie market you. hadn't popped up as much, so it wasn't really... Um, we didn't have any tech, so... <laughs> Yeah, Sydney house prices were, were flat through 95, started to lift and ran till 2003, and then sort of ran flat till 2006, seven. Mm. Um, so it was a completely different place. And um, I'm not sure that Australians are really ready for I got no idea. the next one. Most, but like the majority of the population has no idea what the environment, what you would have seen. Like Clay and I don't really know. Not We may know sort of personal like um, ebbs and flows in terms of our own experiences, but we don't know what an, an con- economic sort of hit to a whole so- society yeah. looks like. I mean, in London, in, when I f- arrived in London in September 83, there was a, 
a big sign on top of City Hall counting the unemployment rate. And they changed it every day. So it was three million and something, I think, the day I arrived. And that's out of a population. What's London's population? Ten million? Um, it was a big number and it got bigger every day. Wow. And, you know, the miners were on strike, the police were in the streets. It was a very it's different big. place. And you go back and look at that now and you go, that's a really prosperous city full of Russian money, um, <laughs> house prices of... Um, yeah, you know, back then you could you could buy a a two bedroom unit for thirty thousand pounds, and um, I don't know what the number is today, but it's a lot more than that. <laughs> Shit, lad. <laughs> but it was a, it was a depressed time. Mm. Interest rates were twelve, thirteen percent. Inflation was six or seven. Uh, unemployment was seven or eight percent. Um, we haven't seen that for. Well, for, forever. Well, not forever, but certainly even the oh, 90s even, recession wasn't that bad. Um, well, even, yeah, and the, the financial crisis impact economically in Australia was very under, um, I guess, more subtle than... The it was a the financial world. services recession, largely. Mm. Yeah, well, by the sounds of it, they need a bit of a haircut. Probably. Hey, <laughs> Speaking of haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I wouldn't mind going, I want to hear some of the stats around. Now that you've got like 4,000 mm-hmm. members, I'd love to hear some stats. But what I wouldn't mind um, is if you can share how the process works with this journey for your clients. Because a lot of advisors, like that's, that's you can have these things that you want to do. But if um, one of the hardest things is when do I do it in the process? Do I do it before they come to the meeting? How does it look? Like what's what's the flow that you go with when you engage with these new clients? Yeah, I mean, the starting point is usually a Facebook post of some form or another. Right. Um, a blog or just so, an advertisement? Um, well, they're generally sponsored posts or videos. Um, just of you or, or of something else? Um, we've been... I, I did the Today Show um, a couple of well, probably a couple of months ago now, yep. and we've been running that video as a great on as a sponsored post, driving people to a landing page to download an ebook on the Life Show. ten reasons why budgets don't work and what you can do about it. Cool, um, and that's just been working its ass off. So that's yeah, you know, three dollar acquisition, acquisition cost. Cost, yep. cost of acquiring a, an email address for three dollars. Like yeah, that's just um, unbelievable. Mm. And interestingly, the cost of a female email address is three quarters of a male cost. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, we'll so just, just <laughs> cut the gender off, eh? Like, um, yeah. Go so, down to a dollar. So that's, so that's the entry point to the funnel. Do you know how much, um, or is it too early for the, the final stat? How, what's the conversion to clients and how much does that technically cost when you... Well, that's the, that's the $64 million question that's still work in progress. Um, our Business plan was based on getting it down to about between 100 and 150 over time. Yep. Um, and the first month business plan, we said, well, let's start at just over 1,000. Um, and we're tracking probably ahead of that. Um, but probably the bigger difference, we'd expected to have this big pool of people who were just paying the $15 a month subscription mm-hmm. and a much smaller pool paying something else, whether they bought a home loan or an insurance policy or well, well, super advice. So the conversion from member to product has been much, much higher than we'd expected. So although there's been fewer in the pool, there's been more in the product. So we obviously need to do something more on that early engagement piece, which is what we're building out now. And, and so people download the book? Yep. Um, and then they'll get into a... Um, an email drip, which introduces them to the, the Life Sherpa eight-step eight step process. Start off with an intro from me. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that takes them through the eight steps with links out to articles that deal with each of the eight steps. So the eight steps are you know, spend less than you earn, build an emergency stash, pay off your debts, sort your super, prepare for the unexpected, which is about risk, get your paperwork short, sorted, which is around... You know what documentation you need for a home loan, wills, power of attorney, all that sort of stuff, and then you move on to buy and pay off your home and invest your surplus. So it doesn't sound like rocket science, but the process leads people through that, and each one of those has a piece of advice that goes with it. Right. So on the spend less in your own, you might buy a budgeting course, or you might buy some budget co- spending coaching, um, pay off your debts. You might buy a debt elimination course, a life sherpa course. Yep. Yep. 
Um, is that like a that's a video course? That you've um, done, we're building these all out using Thinkific at the moment. Um, so the first one that goes live, which is in limited release at the moment, is our pre-marriage course. Exciting! Oh, I feel like a like a priest. Like yeah, well, well, we call it we call it the money vows, and it, it, it's based around ten ten conversations you must have before you get married, and they go through again personality, values, goals, and yeah, move cool. on to dealing with. Debt. Well, actually, before we yep. get off that, Sorry. so so the Clayton actually would probably um, could you email it to him? I'm about to get married, <laughs> yeah. so he's probably going to. So, so the, this eight steps. Uh, so someone comes, downloads the ebook, yep. you get their email. At what point? So, so I understand you're doing these financial eight yep. steps. At what point do people do this personality and values test? That, and that will ha- well, the personality is very early in that process. Like step one or step two or step three or whatever. It, it I think it comes into about email number two in the drip. Right. So, um, so but some people may have come in that way. That's another lead magnet. That right. That's a link to the so quiz. You're, you're so you're not we- really you're not really putting this as a sequential thing. Do this. Do this. Do this. Like as far as that uh, those. Um, values and, and, and all that piece, you're actually blending it in with eight financial lessons. That's right. Right. Um, and where you come into that point is the interesting bit. So you might have done the quiz in, in Facebook. So we've been running that as a, a sort of a giveaway in Facebook and we've been yeah, getting them completed for around $15. Right. So it's, so it's an expensive acquisition well, not expensive, but it's relatively expensive compared to giving an ebook. Yes, it doesn't cost as much to do it. Um, there's a small incremental cost, but it doesn't cost that much, um, and it gets a lot of a lot of a lot of buy-in. Yeah. So, so you, you you answer the quiz. Um, it's 28 statements that you agree or disagree with. So right. it's no, per, no personal information. And who developed this thing for you? Um, well, so the underlying algorithm we licensed out of the US. Um, cool. There's a psychologist called Kathleen Gurney who developed it in the early 80s. Right. And it's been used by um, some of the big advice groups in the US. So you're white labeling that. Yeah. So w- well, right. we've sort of Australianized it, and sure. So we just use the underlying algorithm. So we. But you've just got more answer, swearing. So we answer the questions. This, we answer. <laughs> we host the questions. We send off the answers, and that comes back with a series of results. Yep. And we then take those results and massage it into our report. So Great. the report you get is a life Sherpa report, which reflects our personality and branding and Great. those sort of things. And we started by giving that away on Facebook, which gets a lot of buy-in. So you've got someone who agrees or disagrees with 28 questions, and there's no real personal information in so people feel relatively unthreatened by it. But we actually know quite a lot about someone who's done a money personality test, so we know what your hot buttons are. So we know what the things, you know, whether you're going to be driven by um, aspiration or by fear or... By right, so, and then so and then we what then do you do ta- with that? Then our drip program is then tailored based oh, on. Oh wow! That. So so, cool. so you trigger your this personality, therefore so you, you get, get this, this set of email. Emails. That's great. Right, they're so sort is, of the same emails, but they just slightly. This is kind explained. of like uh, the the announcer thing of how do you like to be communicated to, and then just simply asking them and then yeah. giving them communic- uh, give them. Uh, uh, documentation based on how they like to be, but you're sort of dressing it up a little bit uh, fancier uh, and and offering a little bit more oh, value within 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 that questionnaire. That's right, and it also drives our advice process. So if you score really high on cool. your in, on your in, on an involvement score, yep. your classic teachers and engineers will give you more information in your statement of advice. Wow! So man, this, this is, is what I was talking about. This the other is way. a theme, hey? So you yeah. So f- so for someone who profiles as a optimist or a hunter. We'll go look. Clayton, the answer is A yeah, for nice. these reasons. Yeah. If you profile with a high involvement score, like a producer or an achiever, we'll go look. The answer is A for these reasons. But we also looked at B, C, and D and eliminated them for these reasons. Right. And that actually heads off a lot of those questions. Mm. I mean, you're going to get them anyway. Yeah. So anyone who's had an engineer mm. as a uh, as a client will, will know the level of almost second guessing the client gives of your advice. Yeah. So they want to know every in and out and what every well, fee is. To be fair, you get questioned regardless of their personality, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true, Clayton. <laughs> they all trust me. 
I just want to know more details, well, Paddy, that's all. Patty did provide us with our first Sherpa. So um, our yeah, first advisor really. came from the, the Patty Academy of ah, Real World Financial Planning. One of the many, one of the many <laughs> businesses right. that Patty's got in his uh, rucksack. So, um, so that's where the... So, so that, knows. Except for the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be where you, you come in. You might come in on the money personal. But in, wherever you end up, you end up in this eight-step drip, which, right. I think, which I think has got about 12 emails. And people will fill some out and not others and out. so where they react to those. So in each one, it says, look, here's what step one is, and you'll know you've mastered this when you A, B, C, D, E. Awesome. And each of those has got a hyperlink to an article. Very cool. And that, that, that you've written. That's, that cool. we've, that's hosted on the website. Do they have to do it before they meet you or either no. video or – so there's not a requirement for it to happen before – Of course they, not. They're yeah. captured off the internet. Yeah. Yeah, keep going. Um, so, no, no, I mean like if they haven't done the, that course and they come to you, will you require them to do the quiz before you talk to them more, like have a meeting? You mean the money personality yeah. test? Yes. Uh, yeah. That okay. will always be done as a precursor to – the first discovery meeting. And does that guide, so we've talked about it guiding like communication, does it guide how the meeting goes as well? Yeah, it will guide how we, I mean, it's not all that formal and perhaps that's something we need to do a bit more work on, but it will guide, so an advisor looking at that goes, well, my client is a hunter. So I have a fair feeling about what her, and it is usually her, her hot buttons are and therefore I need to hit these off and I need to, tailor my communications to line up with those expectations. Very cool. So, Do you think it makes it a lot more efficient? Um, yeah, I think. but I think the biggest contributor to the efficiency argument is that the member or client is pre, has made some pre-judgments before they come to that discovery meeting. Yeah. So having worked their way through the, the various tools on the website, they've actually made a a sort of buying decision. So they've realised, oh, look, my budget's out of control, I need some help, or actually this income protection stuff, that's something I should have a look at. So it's not... So the advice process is then a coaching and customer service exercise rather than a sales and education exercise. Yep. And that's where the cost is. So the cost of sitting with a client and going, this is what life insurance is, this yeah. is what TPD yep. means, this is what income protection is, that costs a lot of money. So mm-hmm. if you're... If you need to make 300 bucks an hour for an advisor time, mm. yeah, so if they're making 100 bucks an hour, you need to be making 300 bucks. So how do I do that? You can't do that unless you're going to be charging them a, you know, an assets under management type fee. Or, or a high fixed fee. Or a high fixed fee. Mm. Um, which means they need a relatively high income to be willing to pay it. Mm. Well, that's not a bad segue into actually sharing like how cost competitive you well, guys are. Well, before we get oh, there, before, before we get there, I would love to just get through this these these emails. Sure. So we haven't we have, we haven't actually. So oh, they just keep on going. They just yeah. keep on splitting. So, so there's about twelve out. of them. So there, there's an intro. This is this is who I am and why Life Shaper is what it is and why I set up Life Shaper. Then there's the eight. And interspersed in them, there's a couple of points like um, a little point about, well, if you've already got um, life insurance, uh, why not set us up as your advisor so that we can rebate commissions or give you the advice and manage claims? If you've got a home loan, you say, well, look, if you've had your home loan for more than two years, it's time to have a look at refinancing. So there's a little bit of product stuff in the middle of that stuff. And then when you get to the end, which I think is email 12 off the top of my head there's a well now that you've read that here's some things you could consider doing today Um, like go and complete your freedom factor quiz go and read this try this um, or look at these areas of your life and then um, so through that process our primary goal is to get them to subscribe to a $15 a month subscription or buy a course that's the goal of that exercise. Which can happen at any point. Any point on that, based on what triggers their fancy. And, and then let's say, uh, let's say they don't do a course, but let's say they sign up to the $15 per month. What do they get for that? That gets them access to all of the tools on the website, which is really around, well, there's a whole bunch of resources around education and e-books and all that sort of stuff, which is slowly being turned into video. Um, there's access to an advisor to ask questions, so you can email your Sherpa and say, you know, I've, got the, I've just got this 
tax bill? What do I need to do about it? Should I pay off my hex? Um, there's a whole bunch of questions we get. A lot of them are around this whole, whole hex. creates a lot of angst. Um, and access to our commission rebate program. So if you've already got a uh, a life policy, so if you're already paying a $4,000 a year premium, you'll actually get more rebate than you'll pay us for $15. So that's the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. So they will... Those, that's almost a no-brainer. Yes. Although it does take a bit of explaining. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. first of all, you've got to explain commissions, and then you've got to explain, well, actually we can give it back to you. And actually, your commissions are paying for advice. How many people don't know that there's a commission there or, like, yeah, I guess that's the question. <laughs> I would say, well, probably more than half to most. Yep. Um, I think people realise it when they're buying the product. But they forget about it. But, you know, five years into a life policy, mm. um, I don't think many, certainly my, our experience is that you've actually got to explain to them that there is commissions mm -hmm. and that 10 to 20% of your premium is going in commissions, which is actually supposed to be paying for advice. Now, are you getting the advice you're paying for? So we're not saying that commissions are inherently bad, mm. but it's there for a reason. And it's there for a reason because it's supposed to pay for you know, annual review. So when your statement comes out and says, you know, inflation is 3% this year, your limit's just gone up. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? Is that appropriate? And to deal with claims. And that's the bit that most people don't focus on. And it's the it's a hard message to deliver. You know, if you're selling risk, I'm sure you'd, you'd understand that. Um, so most people don't really get this. So there's a bit of education. So through the emails, we're saying, well, look, here's how the system works. Um, make sure that you're getting value for what you're paying. So they may have, and in most cases, they've been to see an advisor many years ago, who they've never heard of since. And um, most of them are actually quite gobsmacked to realise, actually, I'm still paying that guy mm. money. And that's, I guess, that was the education piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And so similarly with your home loan. So you start with a home loan and you go, well, um, if you've had a home loan for two years, um, someone's probably getting trail on that. And the bank's not rewarding your, your your loyalty, so now let's have a look at that. So there's their, they're the sort of the low hanging fruit that trigger people to do something today. It's very hard to get someone to deal with their will or estate planning today. Yeah, you know they say the best time to write your will is well if you know when you're going to die it's the day before. Right. If you don't know when you're going to die it's today. But giving that piece of advice to someone is really really hard. Mm. And difficult as a leading, and question. and so you've basically just got two revenue models: one for fifteen dollars, one for courses. Is there anything else that you? Yeah, get? so our, our revenue is largely in th three thirds, if you like. Um, there's subscriptions and courses. Mm -hmm. There's home loans, mm -hmm. and there's life mm -hmm. life policies. Yep, and they're the three. And then there's a handful of stuff from you know, car buying, health insurance, personal loans. Um, well, you do courses on them. No, that, that's actual, actual transactions. Oh, right. So you do general insurance as well. Yeah, we got a license to deal in general insurance. Right. Um, we don't do p personal advice on general insurance. Um, but you know, if you go and look at a typical thirty-year-old, well, where's the money being spent? You know, the three decisions that drive where your budget goes is where you live, what you drive, and what you owe. So if we can't deal with those three. Um, we're missing out on big chunks of people's lives. So so where you live is around, you know, well, how much home is right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is usually buy real estate, not too much when the time is right. Mm -hmm. And um, so getting the right, the right purchase price is the fundamental to that question, so not spending too much, and how you fund it. And I said that's, you know, 40% of all fees and commissions paid by Australians for financial services. And then you move into um, obviously insurance, uh, debt elimination, because that's where you are, and the car. And so you don't actually do personal financial advice? Yeah, we do. You do? Yeah. With that we, $15 we, a month? No, no, not for $15 no. a month. So each piece, so that gets you access to general questions. So if someone's got, yes. you know, should I pay off my hex? Um, yeah, you get a response to that. But anything that needs a statement of advice or a credit guide, so anything that's real advice in that traditional sense, 
there's a fee associated with that. It's when Big Vince steps in. <laughs> and that's either a fixed fee. So if you want to, you know, what should I do at my super? Well, that's a fixed fee for that. Sure. Um, for home loans and insurance, it's a fixed fee taken from the commissions. Yep. So we've effectively turned all these variable commissions into fixed fees. Really? And then what do you, and then you rebate, and then you the, rebate rest. the excess. Cool. Um, well, mate, it's, it's, that's a, it's a very complex, multifaceted offering that you've got here. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's still work in progress. Yeah, uh, it's very, very holistic on many, many levels. That's right. And to get the cost down, so we've taken a holistic approach by developing a holistic framework and then delivering individual pieces of advice within that. This sounds like Adrian Patty's dream. Hey. I'm going to say that I haven't been getting a little bit excited by what Vince has been saying. <laughs> <laughs> so all pieces of advice are single topic. Right. So if you want a piece of super advice, you get a statement of advice around super. You want risk? A risk statement of advice. Right. You want a home loan, you get a credit. And then credit. each thing is, uh, the rest is scoped out. Yep. So yeah. So okay. each piece, it's within an overall framework though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the important point. So I think about it as holistic advice delivered sequentially. And what punches out the advice? We have a very large machine called Salesforce. Salesforce punches out your advice. Mm. You're using Conga? We're using Conga, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. um, a bit of Conga. What, what are you paying for your Salesforce? Um, per year. It's a personal question. Salesforce is actually the cheap bit. Um, what? Pardo, Pardo, which is our marketing operations. Oh, you use Pardo. That's like a grand a month or something. Uh, yeah, so our Salesforce bill is about $150 per seat per per month or per quarter. But you've done a lot of customization oh, yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah. So that's like, for, if we want to quantify how much Vince has spent in, depending on what hourly rate you want to use, it's not a cheap piece of software, no. arguably. Yeah. Um, there's a million dollars of s development spend on our balance Pit sheet. Pit my ride sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Over about four years. Yeah, right. Okay. A million bucks about a million bucks. spent or just your time? No, that's actual cash spent. Oh, a million dollars to set up your CRM. Bucks. Well, so CRM is a it's, – it's the whole business. So that includes, right. you know, building all the website. Building out Does all that these tools. Include, oh, that includes say, the, the results to the questionnaires. Yeah, and all that. of that stuff. So the, the total spend on what I would call development stuff. Yes. Which is a combination. Okay, so a million dollars to set up the business, basically, give or take. Over about four years. Um, some of which was provided by the, uh, by the government through the R&D grant system. Mm, um, hell yeah. Well, yes, you would have needed to have a very tailored... We looked into that for what I've been doing and... If you're if you're not spending, it's essentially if you're not spending enough on customising something, you can't qualify. Mm. If you let, if you want to do it a bit more, sort of, um, I would somewhat say efficiently, depending on what state of um, affairs you're. Yeah, involved. Paddy gets a couple of programs, sticks Zapier in between. He's like, what? What? <laughs> well, is this not Boom, enough? Done. <laughs> yeah. no, Give me the millions. It, it's more about starting with, say, you got to do some research or work that you couldn't have known the answer to before. Yes, it's very scientific, yeah. the so, so this is all about saying, well, how do we, do we know that people will actually follow this stuff online? And can we actually build financial competency and skills? Oh, why online? didn't I take that path? I should... So not all of this spending is eligible. So a lot of this, yeah, know, yeah. all the websites. Oh, stuff, and they map it to, yeah. and so then all, they take it away if it doesn't match up, if they do an order as well. That's so right. you sort of. So all the website stuff's all built offshore. So none of that's eligible expenditure. Mm. Well, mate, it sounds very interesting what you've got. Um, it can advisors, is, and we touched on this before, can advisors use any of the tools and things that you've built? Right now, that's probably really hard. Um, okay. We are looking at a bunch of ways that we could um, expand the use of these tools and make them more usable to individuals. Mm. Uh, white labeling the money personality test is probably the first one that yeah. we would look at. But my the big project that we're working on at the moment is to try and create local providers of the Life Sherpa way. So if you think about Life Sherpa as being online, it's like the gym. But there's a huge number of people who actually want a personal trainer. So we are looking, and this is still work in progress, about how we could 
in effect, have endorsed local providers, like accredited life sharer for coaches who could deliver all of this stuff one-on-one locally. Mm-hmm. Um, so using the methodologies, using the back office tools, and um, but delivering it to their clients one-on-one. Um, there's a whole bunch of you know, sort of decisions has to be made as to how you actually do that. So you look at, well, who, who would make a good life sharer accredited coach? Well, it's someone who, they might be a life coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might do property or wealth, so-called wealth coaching. Mm-hmm. They might be financial advisors who want to do a more coaching-based approach. Mm-hmm. Or they could even be mortgage brokers. Now, each of those has got slightly different needs. Um, so for a life coach, they're obviously not qualified to do financial advice, so we'd need to do all of the product advice stuff in the back office Yep. and obviously share the revenue that way. For an advisor, someone who's actually qualified to be IG146 or whatever the, <laughs> the modern equivalent <laughs> of that. Um, I think that's been blown out of the yeah. water. Well, recently. that technically <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> at least the register doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, they might benefit from becoming an authorised rep of Money Sherpa, which is our licensee, um, but still trying to work that through. So, but it would start with a well, coaching I've, course, and in some sort of ongoing support. I've got support. 400 or so mates looking for <laughs> a uh, for a job <laughs> <laughs> recently. So, so it's it's obviously someone who has that approach to wants to take that approach with their. Clients. So you'd be open to ex Dover guys coming knocking. That's right. Okay. Um, I mean, we put that out. Um, Obviously, it doesn't suit everyone. Mm. Um, we have a very specific offering. Does everyone have to wear that that laundry tax deduction shirt right there? <laughs> <laughs> no, they are available. We have them in the merch shop. You can buy T-shirts, polo shirts. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> the Life Shirt for Merch Shop is open for business. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, so someone who comes from a traditional um, – I think a lot of Dover advisors may have come from an accounting background, mm. and it – Financial financial planning was an add-on to the business. Mm. Probably might not suit that sort of, but a an advisor who's focusing on um, the younger uh, clientele with less of an investment advice focus, we could suit. So happy to have a chat to anyone who's listening. Awesome, man. And so what's the best way for them to get in contact? Um, you can call 1300 My Sherpa mm-hmm. or get on the lifesherpa.com.au website and uh, submit a... Uh, Ask you Sherpa question. Awesome, man. Well, or we have you. Intercom on the website. You can Ooh, get on the You've got line. Intercom on the website. And interestingly, <laughs> this blows me away. The, the most common response, it pops up and says, um, yeah, is there anything we can help you with today? And the number of people who type in, no, just browsing thanks, is <laughs> huge. Does that tell you stop bothering people? <laughs> <laughs> it, it just... <laughs> Yeah, you know, that and that's ca- counted as good, but because you've gotten some engagement, yeah, that's the first but, but touch it, point. It was just uh, not expected. Uh, and the other, the m- most common financial question is, can I get hex if I'm bankrupt? Don't ask me why. Okay, that's hilarious. Do you have um, a bot on there? On on the the, the, the website on the intercom. The messenger, yeah, the intercom. Yeah, intercom. Well, it only asks the first question automatically. Oh, you got to like have all the. Oh, let's not get him started. <laughs> <laughs> all right, mate. Great to have you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Vince. Thank you.